AI, with great data comes even greater access latency. Welcome to the Presto Community Broadcast, where we transform your latency woes into fast insights. I'm your host, Brian Olson. And I'm your co-host, Brian, I'm Manfred Moser. Are you the co-host? I feel like that, that just pushes you down a notch. <laughs> <laughs> we are each other's co-hosts there we go. and yeah. helpers. <laughs> I am also the co-host. Um, <laughs> Presto Community Broadcast is a show where we cover events, happenings, and everything else in the open source Presto community, uh, showing off some cool stuff about Presto. Uh, but first, uh, let's have a little word from our sponsor, Starburst Data. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Starburst Data, for hosting this show. Starburst is an enterprise offering that builds upon open source Presto distribution. The main vectors you improve upon when moving to Starburst are performance, support, and simplicity to deploy. The performance gains come from an enterprise suite of Presto connectors that improve upon the open source connectors by offering parallel implementations and improved statistics exposed to the cost base optimizer. There are also connectors that don't exist in the open source projects, such as the Snowflake connector and Delta Lake connector, and many other that prove useful in many enterprise applications. My favorite thing that Starburst offers is how they take away the pain of deployment, security, and scaling your Presto cluster up by offering Kubernetes deployments on multiple cloud platforms. This relieves a lot of pressure from your ops team and offers them a slick user interface called Mission Control that makes the management of your cross-platform clusters easy. Finally, they have a team of experts that are available to address any issues you experience. This team includes the original founders of Presto, a dedicated customer success team, and even Manfred and myself. We clearly think the product is great, but don't take our word for it. Try Presto for free. Head on over to starburstdata.com to learn more. And now back to the show. Okay, so I wanted to quickly get this like out there is... Uh, I last week we actually had our inaugural uh, broadcast, and I kind of dropped the ball a little bit. I uh, uh, supposed to have some sort of a setting on the Presto SQL uh, uh, Twitch channel where it's basically this little like slider thing and by default you're basically not set to uh, save any any previous broadcast so I didn't set this up because I was testing everything out on my own uh, Twitch channel, Bits on Data Dev. And uh, so whenever we moved over to Presto SQL, I was just trying to avoid like, you know, pre-broadcasting too much. And uh, it eventually turned out that uh, we did not record last week. So, uh, or last two weeks ago, I should say now. Um, so That's okay though, Brian. I mean, it was an awesome event. We went for two hours. Yeah. We had Carol and Renak join us. Yeah. We had a lot of chats. We had a bunch of audience and we will get them back. So if yeah. you missed out last time, that's okay. We will catch up and we'll talk about a whole bunch of things today as well. So For sure. don't worry. Yeah. And, and so I wanted to also kind of put, put, point that out there that if you were here last two weeks ago, uh, we are actually going to be kind of rehashing a couple of the things that we missed because we wanted to have this first recorded episode. Uh, I swear it's recording this time. Uh, we <laughs> <laughs> it, that uh, this episode, we want to actually have like some of the initial basics of Presto that we covered last time. And uh, so we're, we're going to kind of of be doing a replay of it. So if you were here last week, uh, just be be ready for that. But there are going to be a couple new things that we're bringing up this week as well. And uh, we're not going to, we will be bringing Carol and Renak back uh, in a future episode. So um, so with that, let's uh, hop into the news. I'm going to go hop on down to the code scene and let's pull up first uh, a couple events that are coming up. So uh, first event uh, is going to be the... Um, the Big Data ATL event, uh, that is going to be Tuesday, October 13th. Uh, it's a meetup uh, basically just talking about anything from data visualization. And uh, we're, we have a talk there that's uh, going to be talking about Presto with uh, Cole Fraser and, um, and then Delta Lake. A lot of really, really cool stuff uh, that uh, is going to be in this, uh, this meetup. So uh, it's free to go to. It's an online event. So I uh, hope to see you guys there. Uh, we'll also be, yeah, just to be clear, the 6.15 p.m. to 7.45 is, is an Easter time. Unfortunately, uh, that's, you know, that's the uh, East Coast of, of the United States. Uh, so uh, it's going to be hopefully like kind of difficult for some of you, I guess, uh, on the other side of the, of the globe uh, to attend some of these. But uh, hopefully we will get some more of uh, our own events set up that will be a little more friendly to those in the Asia Pacific areas. 
Um, so another one uh, is going to be uh, the, this uh, tech talk coming up in Portland. Um, this is on Tuesday. Thursday, October 8th. Uh, so uh, Justin Borgman, our CEO, CEO of uh, Starburst, is going to be there to talk a little bit about uh, running analytics uh, and modern data management. So uh, he'll be uh, hitting this talk on uh, October, what was it again? October 8th. Eighth. And and then uh, is it seven? No, it's not quite seven days later, like uh, five days later. Uh, if you missed that one, these are all so... These, these all say that they're kind of in particular locations uh, based on the time zones, but uh, we, we do have, um, you know, this, this roughly the same uh, type of meeting or talk that is going to be showing up at all these Tech Talk summits. And this one is going to be in Minneapolis, but uh, so we'll be at a slightly nicer time for those uh, living in central time zone as well. Uh, and so we will be posting a, f- a much fuller set of these virtual Tech Talk summits uh, so that if there's one that doesn't quite, you know, meet with your schedule, you can try to uh, find the uh, find the other ones. Um, OK, so outside of that, uh, why not also bring up, uh, you know, another great source of news. Uh, September hasn't come out yet for this uh, Presto newsletter, but uh, Starburst does have a Presto newsletter that uh, comes out monthly, uh, has like a lot of good information, um, a couple of events that did happen already. But then uh, we have some webinars and links to various recordings uh, of these webinars that uh, that are good resources to, uh, to check out. Uh, you can definitely get some uh, cool stuff. We did a really neat uh, kind of hands-on Presto workshop with Big Data uh, Boutique a, a while back. Uh, so really, really fun stuff. Um, and then we'll also kind of go into various uh, blog posts and, and other things. So, so definitely check that out. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the uh, to the newsletter, it's uh, uh, pretty pretty good. I think you can just find it under resources on the Starburst site. And go to Preston newsletter. Um, and then uh, finally, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the uh, latest trainings from uh, David, Dane, and Martine. Uh, these have come out over the last two months. Uh, I should say last two. Now it's uh, August and uh, uh, July. We uh, put out some of these really kind of advanced level uh, SQL uh, tutorials uh, as well as uh, query optimization um, was the uh, 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 one that Martine gave. And then uh, two two different uh, talks that Dane gave, one on security, uh, the other one on, on uh, tuning performance uh, and kind of a prod operations type envir- environment. So... Uh, so these are all really great resources. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, basically they're just like these, uh, videos here, I'll click on one of them just so you can kind of see, uh, we have, you know, some information around them, uh, on the, uh, in in a particular blog, but then it ends up being, you know, these, uh, kind of 30 to to one hour long videos, uh, of these. Actually, uh, they are, the, all the classes are two hours, by the way. Oh, two hours. (laughs) uh, Don't, don't scare people away, Brian. Um, (laughs) while this one is advanced SQL, the others, all of them are like i wouldn't call them entry level we did talk, we do talk a bit about what presto is but as ultimately those are all things that you need to know if you run a presto cluster i mean the sql one is more so if you're a data analyst that writes sql queries against presto mm-hmm. but the other three securing tuning and like just setting it up for performance those are things you need to know if you want to run a presto cluster and they're an incredible good start to learn those things much more if it like if you watch those two three uh for a few hours you will know much more than if you spent the, t- the same time reading docs or playing around they're very very good so um definitely worth watching and yeah i, I definitely also enjoyed hosting them and reviewing the slides and stuff i learned a lot from them so it's definitely worth it. So yeah, so that. we would say kind of like you know if you're if you're want and already kind of aware of what Presto is and you've worked around with like Presto but you kind of want to go to the next level maybe some you know intermediate to advanced level uh, uh, series then then these are these are where you want to kind of check out next uh, other than just reading the docs is that kind of yeah. a fair summary? Yeah, and and if you then want to find out more about what other people do in practice, you can look at the Presto Summit series, right? Like those are. Like uh, the first one is the state of Presto where Martin, Dane, David, and Piotr talk about what's coming up for Presto. Some of those things are actually true already because this was recorded, I think, in May. So mm-hmm. um, by now, a lot of those things are like not a, like a bunch of those things are already available in the recent releases, which, by the way, we're just about to cut another one, 342. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, the others are 
practical use cases at companies that use Presto considerably, like at like pretty large scale, uh, especially like ARM treasure data or, yeah. and like they have very different use cases. So you can see how, how flexible and powerful Presto is with different data sources, writing your own connector, abstracting all your legacy things with yep. that and scaling, analyzing queries, the challenges you can have with running Presto at massive scale. Like it's very, very interesting all, all for them. So it's one of the ones awesome. I thought was pretty neat uh, as I listened in on the Zora one and they, they actually kind of took one of their legacy one of their legacy services that they didn't really want to touch and built basically a, 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 an abstract or a kind of a, a, a connector abstraction on top of it so that, you know, yeah, exactly. they could expose the, uh, that, that service uh, as a table instead of having to rewrite it and maybe move, like basically move everything out of that. And so they could basically just abstract it now as some presto table and do joins with it and do everything that you can do once you have, uh, have that, uh, anything exposed as a, as a table. Yeah, press, so that, that, cool. That's amazing, right? Like, Presto generally can do that. This is even more cost. Like generally, Presto can act as sort of the, the consumption layer for all sorts of queries. For sure. Uh, across data sources, they abstract it even more so that on the fly, the connector knows, well, that kind of data from like two years ago is over there. The new one is over here, right? Yep. So that's really amazing. And for the users, super powerful. And also oh, yeah. enables them to do migrations and stuff without, like for the users, it doesn't matter where the data lives as long as it comes and returns in the query, right? So, yep, yep. Oh yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it it definitely takes off a lot of like that overhead of just like oh man, what how are we going to like integrate this this or you know especially when you're moving things so either moving to different like uh, data pipelines or if you're moving like a particular uh, uh, source of like you know you have two or three different uh, applications or or um, or basically like data sources that you need to, to uh, pull in there. And you, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can do it through, you know, either abstracting it or you, you building out like uh, some sort of a, a layer on top that, that plugs into one of the existing connectors. So, yeah, exactly. So it's pretty neat. It's also amazing. Like, I mean, if you think that doesn't happen often, you're totally wrong. Like it's amazing. <laughs> like every company constantly goes through platform changes, storage changes of where the data is stored. And then not to mention like, you know, acquisitions and mergers and that kind of stuff. It yep. always goes crazy in the end. And Presto is awesome for that to just like have one front end, so to speak, to the data. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like anybody who who's working at a company now that's that's currently dealing with any type of migration, like, you know, they've been through it at multiple times. They, you, you know, there's no convincing anybody there. But for those of you that just like have never worked at a company or never been on a like particularly in the kind of data database uh, team section or anything like that or done data engineering uh, work, that is like almost, I would say, I don't know. Fifty percent of the that's fifty percent of the job is yeah, is usually migration. <laughs> so, um, and then lastly, before I uh, hop on to, uh, did we did we totally skip the release? <laughs> we didn't skip it. I mentioned it that we like that's it's one of those things, right? Like Presto SQL is an open source project, and there's a lot of contributions going on, and yeah. it feels like ages ago. But three forty one was released literally just like two something weeks ago, like yeah. 8th of September, right? Yeah. So it's not that long ago. And there were massive amounts of changes, right? Like if you go through everything from a lot of the adaption to the new, more powerful uh, timestamp treatment, like that's coming up in a lot of the connectors, right? Like timestamp used to just be down to uh, milliseconds now, depending on the data source, but in general, press is suitable all the way down to picoseconds. So you can use it for financial transactions. And that's obviously a large change that goes across all the connectors that was in there. I think the Salesforce authenticator was, was added, which is kind of amazing as an example implementation yep. to basically show that Presto can use any sort of authentication system. All you have to do is implement one and the default ones are like password, right? And uh, LDAP. But if you are level of record, so to speak, for your users in terms of authentication is Salesforce. Now you can use that one. I'm, I'm surprised actually with Salesforce. Like I, I know very little about Salesforce because I've never done too much with it, but I th I know it's like kind of, is it have like a people management? Is that where oh, yeah, this yeah, kind yeah. of use it's, case? It's like, well, oh. it's like a CRM, right? Like customer yeah. relationship management out of the box kind yeah. of thing. Like that's where it came from. Yeah. And it includes managing all your people theoretically. Like it's, it's huge, even within right? your organ. Cause I knew it was like managing kind of your, your customers and things like that. But I didn't, I guess I just never thought of it as like a, a tool that where you manage, you, you can you basically can, replace right? LDAP or something. 
Yeah, like ultimately, a lot of organizations, I think, sort of like move even towards it to some degree if they're very customer focused, right? Every customer rep and every sales and every support person already needs to be in there, right? So if yeah. that's your heavy focus, depending on your press to use case, right? Like if your press to use case in, to, is to, to basically enable these people to look at customer data, that's perfect, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, I saw this one up here. Did we, did we just now add the iceberg connector? I thought this had been added a while back, actually. Uh, the iceberg connector is one of those things that um, it's been in development for quite a long time. It ha it's running in sort of like close to production in various places already, but it's constantly evolving and being improved even more so. And now we basically made the step to say, look, we're throwing it in the docks and it's available. So okay. uh, we did a lot of work to lift that up over the table. So where we are like confident that you can sort of like muck around with it now and start gotcha. using it. So it's sort of like more officially there. Under the hood, it was already there for a while, but. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. So Iceberg X, so it was kind of like an incubator phase and now we just took it out to kind of uh, general Yeah, audience. you could say that that oh, way, right? Like, okay. Um, and iceberg is a Netflix thing, I believe, I believe is, uh, yeah, I think so. That's like, uh, like, you know, like press to seek as an open source project has a lot of contributors from across the industry, including we're very, very, like very, yeah. uh, tightly working with, um, people in, in the various user communities that use Presto and help with it. And Iceberg is one of them. Yeah. Um, I think it's now Apache project, isn't it? Now it's, a, yeah, so saying Iceberg's yeah. moved where now uh, Iceberg yeah. has been donated to the Apache Software Foundation, but you can still find it on, under the Netflix uh, GitHub. So yeah, if, if you if you click, there's a link to the Apache website, actually, like is underneath it? there in the readme site, iceberg.apache.org. So here. Like no, uh, one, one above. Like what? go. Uh, All right, this no, is go. Apache Iceberg now though, what? Okay. Uh, where is it? Let's go site one for uh, okay. yeah, one. That's Iceberg the Dark actual Apache. documentation. Right? Oh, so, cool. Okay. Yeah, I see it now. Cool. So that has been added. I know a lot. Of, I, I've heard, I mean, I've never, I don't even, I haven't even messed with Iceberg yet, but uh, I've heard a lot of cool things about it. I've, I've seen a lot of people really using it. So I, I'm guessing it's becoming like way more popular. So yet another. Yeah, uh, it's just another one of those where like, super high-end performance becomes available for certain use cases with this new table format and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It's one of those things, right? Like Hive, the Hive connector enables you to talk to all sorts of things yeah. in terms of object storage, but there's definitely differences, right? Like it makes a, a huge difference if you query like JSON files, CSV files, or more optimized things like Pucky or Org. Oh yeah. And Iceberg sort of like takes that to the next level too, is even more specialized. And in this case, even better because it's a, a dedicated connector so it can take advantage of like specifics that iceberg supports some right? some so, knobs that they expose and things like that yeah like you know like starburst has like the snowflake connector and yeah or, or the map r connector that sit on top of like like improve other connectors like the lessons from other connectors yeah. and add transactional capabilities and those kind of things right like so iceberg is one of those where it's also in the community just okay. like you could think of the BigQuery connector contributed by Google yeah. as something like that. That's just like taking that concept, applying it and making it special for the connector, which always improves the performance, right? Because you can take advantage of whatever that system involves in terms of like pushing down functions or taking out the table statistics and that kind of stuff. Totally, totally. Do we have anything else we wanted to kind of point out in this release before we move on? No, I think we should, can move on. Like yeah. the release notes are very comprehensive and most of the things are always in the docs. And 342 is around the corner. Literally, we're working on the release notes now. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. so I, was, I think we were planning on talking about 342 today, but then uh, but then we, we lost it. So it's good. We, we Since I didn't record the last episode, then this will give us a chance to talk about 341. And uh, uh, th next episode, uh, stand by for some happenings in 342. Exactly. Cool. Last bit of the news. Uh, I wanted to point out these uh, recent podcasts that uh, that happened. Uh, we had um, uh, Dane, David, and Martine. Uh, the the uh, for those that don't know, uh, co-founders of Presto. Uh, they uh, went on to a uh, podcast called Contributor. Uh, its uh, website is Contributor. Dot FYI forward slash presto uh, to go to that particular episode. And uh, they they talk about like the history of like kind of 
they they talked about the history in, in a level that uh, was deeper than like they've ever kind of like delved into before. Uh, and what m- amazed me the most is that they actually got David to talk <laughs> this time because usually <laughs> he's pretty quiet. Uh, and so he, we got to hear, you know, kind of how they met at Ning and and kind of uh, how uh, the progression along uh, along those lines of basically how they got into Facebook before they even started Presto. So the the. Um, the host for that that podcast did a really good job at kind of you know looking at all the different aspects. So uh, so it's pretty pretty neat uh, show. And that will if there, if you are totally new to Presto, this not only kind of covers the the history and gives you a nice story behind it, but then it really goes into you know what what is Presto? Why is the op- why why did they create it as an open source project and and all of those things? And then the next podcast uh, is is data is the data engineering podcast. Uh, we've we've had uh, people from from starburst and uh just presto proper uh that are have been showing up on that show for like since the beginning i feel like there's some really old episodes with camille and and martine i don't know if martine had been on there before but but i think camille's been on there before but really that yeah. that in general is just a great podcast i love listening to data engineering podcasts um but uh yeah we got uh the kind of more updated presto distributed sql episode uh and martine is talking about you know kind of giving everybody a little bit of a background info but then getting more into the specifics so uh i'll add that uh, link uh, the link the link for that one's a little more complicated i'll add that in the uh, show notes um, in fact, I will do that right now, um, so I don't forget. And we'll just, you know, make sure we edit this part out of the podcast. <laughs> All right. So, um, or we won't. <laughs> you'll you'll find out later. Um, okay. So, wrapping that section up, that is the news. Uh, let's go on to the concept of the week. So. Um, as the inaugural show, uh, I think it's more than fitting that uh, uh, I hand this over to to Manfred, uh, and we'll go back into the interview scene here. Uh, and Manfred, do you want to just kind of cover, like, for those that haven't ever, like, messed with Presto or you haven't even really heard of it at all, like, mm-hmm. what is Presto? If you if I'm, like, a brand new person, a uh, brand new developer that wants to, you know, come up and, and kind of either get involved in the open, some open source and, um, and I'm interested in databases, uh, how would you, is, is Presto a database or what is Presto? Like, wh- why is it so special or different from any other kind of uh, uh, database or, or data? storage type of thing is it data storage or is it you know an engine or what's going on well let's 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 step back so what's like if you look on a super high level there's a few terms that basically come up it's a mpp which is a three-letter acronym as usual right like it's very important to know these uh, massively parallel processing sql standardized uh, standard query language uh engine so uh, and it's a query engine so there's three things right SQL, the standard query language is like uh, basically the language uh, for getting data coming uh, out of relational or sort of some sort of table format, right? Like it's been around since forever, um, starting in like, I don't know, in the 60s or something probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, And is the standard technology, every BI tool, every um, like anal- analytics tool, they all understand SQL as a query language. So there's a massive amount of standard and tooling and stuff around. And like every developer at some stage, I think in the course of their career will run into SQL and dive into it more or less. I know I have. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, it doesn't so, really matter so, what level you're at either. If you're trying to do databases and trying to be on more of a kind of back-end development, you're going to touch databases clearly, and that makes more yeah, sense. You, but then if you're even on the front end, like, you know, front end or or even data science or even, you know, I feel like I've ran into a couple sales and like kind of uh, line of business type people that are, that are you know, able to, to pull out oh, a little yeah, bit of totally. SQL. Like, you know, in the past, I mean, I'm dating myself now, but I remember <laughs> totally where people are like, Oh, how can you help me with these queries in Microsoft Access and stuff like that? <laughs> where like, like you know, like basically it's a file on your disk yep. that you fire up, and then like if you want to give someone else the data, you copy the database file over, and then they do their stuff, right? Like crazy yep. stuff like that. Um, even then, it was already SQL as a or SQL as some people like so politically yeah. uh, <laughs> highly highly. Uh, uh, like opinionated say that you have to say SQL, whatever. <laughs> um, so it's, a, it, and uh, Presto allows you to query all sorts of data sources with using SQL. That's important because in the last, whatever, let's say 10, 15 years, 
lots of other methods than like the typical relational databases came up to store data. And um, in many cases, they thought they need to reinvent the wheel and come up with some other query language or API, or they just said, well, whatever, we don't like, you know, you just store the blobs and then you figure out yourself how you get it out sort of thing. So uh, Presto allows you to get at that data with SQL. And what it does is it is a query engine. So it can process those SQL queries, SQL queries onto whatever is underneath. So that can be just files in an S3 bucket um, and like metadata, metadata stored in a Hive meta store. It can be an actual relational database or it can be like Oracle, Postgres, SQL Server or any of those kind of things. Or it can be something completely different like a stream from Apache Kafka system or uh, like a document database like MongoDB or Elasticsearch. All of those can be queried with SQL and Presto. And you can even combine them. So you can query, uh, cry, write queries where some data comes out of Elasticsearch, some kinds of the object storage, some kinds of your Oracle database. Um, all the data is queried where it sits. So Presto does not pull the data in and store it itself. It just queries where it lives. So right at in the object storage uh, or in your S3 buckets, or your org files or whatever it is, or in your relational database. So you don't need to move the data around to query it. And so that makes the whole like data warehousing and ETL kind of processes much uh, less important and they can often slow down processes. And then the last uh, thing is the MPP aspect, massively parallel processing. Um, Presto is extremely fast at doing that query. Mm -hmm. Like the way it achieves that is it has what's called a cluster. So it's not just one server that does the work. It's one, what we call the coordinator, mm -hmm. which receives the query, but, and then plans what needs to be done. But then once it actually needs to connect to the data, it doesn't do it itself. It forms it out to a cluster. And the typical clusters range in the, like having quite large machines, right? Like, 16 cores all the way up to like 64 or whatever, like many cores up to like 256 gigabyte of memory. So really big beefy machines and not just one of them, but like 10, a hundred or so. And they then all at once flood uh, whatever data source to get the data as fast as possible. And that enables analytics that are just not possible otherwise, right? You can literally run queries where in the day so when Martin uh, and the gang basically started that mm -hmm. the use case was that analysts at Facebook just couldn't run their queries with Hive where it like well uh, they, like I think they were saying something like a good day is when you run two or three Hive queries a day I think it was six well, <laughs> or something like that yeah. right and now it's like minutes with Presto yep or less right so that enables and unlocks completely different use cases. And that's that's ultimately what Presto is. So, so does Presto then, you know, the, I think a lot of confusion, pe people will look at Presto and they kind of get it, see it lumped in with like database products. So uh, what distinguishes like Presto then from a database? Does it actually store data or what? Well, it, that's the thing, right? It doesn't actually store the data. Mm -hmm. It unlocks the data in wherever it's stored, right? And mm -hmm. so it can be that you just, query your data warehouse if you already have that or your oracle database or your hive storage your s3 buckets your ms like your azure blob storage files or whatever right and mm. you can also transform the data right like if you have it in like some blob storage and it's slow there you can transform it and throw it over into a, into a different format even just like from json over to org files or whatever yeah. and then query it regularly faster there so yeah. it doesn't worry about the storage at all yeah the other advantage of that is that it just needs to be as large as what it needs for processing so if the storage is not nest like if you don't look at the records that are like 10 years old and mm -hmm. they're stored on some server well you don't need to run a database server on top of it it's separating the computation of the queries from the from the storage of that data yeah, just pretty cool. One one thing I feel like it's pulled up a lot uh, when people are first learning about Presto as well. Like maybe they're already kind of established data engineers, or or they've at least worked in the space enough to kind of uh, you know they've they've maybe been around for 10, 10 to twenty years or something like that, and they've they've dealt with you know this kind of 
that what they think is this kind of technology. And so there's mm -hmm. a term that gets thrown, like that's very commonly thrown around with Presto that's called data virtualization because, uh, you know, Presto does a lot of this same thing where you're basically getting these multiple catalogs of, of databases that, uh, like that, you know, that you're connecting to as, as sources. Uh, why? So in a lot of ways, those, that technology, a lot of people kind of, you know, it became a trend for a while, I think back in the uh, early 2000s. And then, you know, when it, it like decreased in popularity and everybody went back to the original way of doing things. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, it's like one, one thing that can like, I think confuses a lot of people is like, how is Presto different from those? Like, do you, uh, you know, those particular data virtualization uh, uh, pieces, like, you know, I'm not going to mention any ones in particular that currently exist still, but We'll just say, uh, you know. Well, I think a lot of those data virtualization systems still sort of like on the fly, as you say, virtualize the data. So they, they suck the data in from those sources and they do like the storage and managing that stuff on the fly. Yeah. Which then means you have a, a like, a, like you still again end up with these delays and having to define that. Presto literally goes back down to the, the actual storage. Like for example, with with like all these uh, queries that run into object storage systems and stuff like yeah. S3 or so, it literally reads the files from the disk and mm. processes them. It doesn't go and run HiveQL queries or some stuff like that, yeah. or like it literally reads the file from the disk. And even like if there's like bucketing or, or something like that set up, it literally just like already before it, uh, like it doesn't even read the files that it knows aren't going to be necessary like if there's a wear condition in in the in the query that sets up a certain date for example yeah it's not going to go and look at all the other dates because it knows all the dates is in that one directory so i'm just going to read the files in that directory and worry about those only so yeah um it literally goes right down to the middle basically yeah i mean in a lot of ways too like what what a lot of these systems like had to refer to is like they didn't have their own like processing engine that that you know with this this whole kind of army of of nodes to run and do all this compute right so they had to rely a lot on the underlying systems for these old data virtualization technologies so if you had like database a and database b and you need to run a calc like a kind of a join between these uh you know uh running running a join between these two systems then you know when i do this kind of heterogeneous join uh I have to either move the data, maybe I'll find out, you know, do some smarts where I figure out what's the smaller amount of data that I have to move, but I actually have to move that data into, you know, from database B to database A, and then actually run the calculation on database A. So that's like, that's time that, that, you know, you get yeah, hit exactly. on just for even moving that data. So it, with Presto, I, it seems like that's not the case, right? You're, we, uh, we in Presto, like you'll have, multiple nodes, basically this army of nodes that uh, are, are kind of the computation engine, pulling up these, the data that's, you know, trying to pull up the minimal amount of data from each source that is required for this, you know, the, the result in the computation to be correct. And then in, at once it gets those data, data kind of like streaming through, it kind of on the fly will will do all of this uh, optimization to try to you know uh, cut out anything along each each path. And you can imagine it as kind of a as a, a DAG, which is a direct a cyclic type graph thing, where you're you know these nodes are just kind of pumping different uh, sets yeah. of data through. So so yeah, so I think uh, that's that's a good explanation overall of like uh, you know what why Presto is to, it, Presto so kind of is a de data virtualization, but it's not done the way that traditional data virtualization was yeah. done. It's also, kinda... what's what's very interesting is all that, like typically when these systems are doing like ETL processes or like you were saying, virtual virtualization, a lot of those systems suffer from one of the typical like performance bottlenecks, which is IO, right? Like as yep. soon as you have IO, where you're writing to disk, things like that's always like whenever you are doing any performance tuning first you're going to look at those kind of like network io and disk kind of io yeah well yeah. what presto is doing is it eliminates that whole disk io because everything is in memory that's why the presto nodes the workers mm -hmm. typically need a lot of memory because all the processing of the data like applying func sql functions aggregations all that kind of stuff and then even like all of that happens in memory 
and then is passed over the wire to the next work or the coordinator. And then again, everything happens in memory. So nothing is ever going down to disk. So there's a tremendous performance gain from that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so trying to think if there's anything else we, I mean, we obviously can't cover everything there is to know about Presto. Um, one thing I will recommend, and this is something we can add in the show notes is, uh, there is an O'Reilly book, uh, that, uh, is, is offered for free by Starburst and they, uh, we can add a link to that, uh, in the show notes as well. Um, that, uh, that book is, uh, very useful kind of, uh, bringing you up from beginner to intermediate, but also if you're already, you know, somewhat familiar with Presto, it can take, you know, a lot of your under current understanding and, and bring you on to the next thing. And as well as, you know, supplementing that with, with the other resources that we talked about earlier in the, in the new, uh, segments of, uh, training, I think that that's uh, a lot of, a lot of good resources to get you started, uh, with, with, uh, uh, yeah, the book, you. the book probably cost me like three months of my of my life because <laughs> I, I wrote that earlier uh, this year, I guess. Yeah. And um, it has three parts. One is the beginner. Another one is then the sort of like overview of connectors mm -hmm. and sort of intermediary. And then the like real world example that goes all the way into like explain the web UI in more detail and yeah. talking about performance tuning and that kind of stuff. So, yep. and it's available for free. So it's totally a, a good resource to digest. Absolutely. All right. Uh, well, with that, let's go on to our PR of the week. Uh, PR for those that are are uh, new to uh, any type of Git or any kind of um, uh, like not just GitHub, but just you know in general um, the what am I trying to say here? Just like workflows in general. Uh, a pull a PR is a pull request. So uh, when we say PR, we're just basically saying a this would be a um, uh, a, a request to take a copy that you've made of, of the code. For instance, uh, you say, I want to make some change to the original code. So in order to do that, you'll make a copy of this code, uh, and then you will, uh, make some modifications and then, uh, you'll do what's called this pull request. So then, uh, and here being an example, I, I, uh, uh, I, I, not going to uh, really talk too much to it, but in the thing that I'm displaying right now on uh, on my screen, there's basically a, a split screen. There's going to be one screen where there's uh, code that's either been like removed or kind of what was the previous code. And then you're going to have a screen to the right that's going to show you like what the new code looks like. And this will be a nice little view for somebody who's maintaining the original code to say, okay, is this something we want to accept or not? So, um, so for any of those of you that are not familiar with what PR means, that's basically what it is. It's a, it's a, a cycle that you can do, like a, a request that you can do where you uh, run into a cycle where you'll be trying to add new code in and have it get reviewed and uh, ultimately add it into the original code base. And so in this case, we're looking at Presto. Um, and so uh, Martin, I, uh, not, not Martin, uh, <laughs> Manfred, you have some uh, 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 background on on this. Would you want to kind of explain like what this yeah. PR feature is and why it was kind of uh, added in? Yeah. So in this case, um, this is a pull request that I wrote, um, which just covers the documentation. So that's a, a good example for even beginners in the Presto ecosystem can submit pull requests to improve the documentation even for their own like you find a spelling type or so and then in this case i'm taking it sort of to the next level um the uh sql select statement here got an improvement where um the with statement can now use um the recursive function the way this came about was that the, this is actually, and it's quite amazing, right? Like for those of you that don't know SQL in detail or know SQL on the surface a little bit, it's incredible how much uh, functionality is baked into modern SQL dialogues. Mm -hmm. And for example, recursion, like recursive processing of uh, some queries is actually part of the SQL standard. And um, this came up as a request in one of our customers. And so we thought, well, that makes sense. We should add that. And so we did. Um, that was uh, already merged in the recent release 341, but we also want to make sure the documentation is updated. So I'm trying to catch up and add the documentation. And this here basically explains the syntax, that little snippet there, which goes and does the with recursive statement where 
you basically see that it's with recursive. Then there's this bracket section where it goes, the initial values dot one just define values one in bracket defines the start or what's called the base relation in the recursion. And then this unions it all with a separate query. That separate query just uses the base recursion uh, to start and then iterates through until in this case, uh, the where clause uh, has a n my, less than four, which means it goes and iterates through basically to a total of four values. Mm -hmm. First recursion has one, then it uses that one to add one, which creates the number two, and then it does that multiple times. So in the end, you have one plus two plus three plus four as values, which then adds up to, guess what? Well, adds up to 10. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's what this does, right? Like in the, the final query and the bottom goes select sum of n, uh, which does, which basically means take the values that the recursion above produced, which are the one, two, three, four, and sum them up. So I'm gonna, I have, uh, this is gonna be just like, we're, we're gonna run this uh, and just see what, what comes out. And so uh, for podcast listeners, we, we're basically taking this query uh, and, and we will add the link to the, um, to the uh, pull request if you wanna go run this on your own query. But basically when you run this query, what ends up coming out is 10. Um, if you were to take the select statement, I would kind of curious. You could to go see. select just star from T, go do that. And we should and be able to see one, two, three, four, right? That's right. Yeah. One, two, or, oh, all well, in a different. Well, the order. Yeah. That's interesting. Huh. I'm not sure why the, or like, why the order would not be one, two, three, four, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. That is very odd. Well, oh, you know why? Why? It might. Okay. So that's one of the things that's important to understand also. The way. Um, the way this works, it's 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 true recursion. So it aborts at n uh, less than four. Mm -hmm. um, so it, when n is three, essentially, uh, with the next one, it aborts. Um, but the whole query as Presto like, works on this, it creates a query plan up front. And then a query plan is execute like broken up into multiple parts okay. and then they run in parallel so that's why it probably comes back on on timing so like try this and actually a good good experiment run it again and see if the order changes oh yeah it should right yeah we're expecting it could, like it could is what i'm saying yeah right? like for yep, yeah, yeah see fair enough right like so so basically presto even with a simple query like that breaks up the logic of the query, runs the parts in parallel, and then does the, the rest of it. So that's extremely efficient. Um, built, and of course, this is also dangerous, right? <laughs> so it's a kind of experimental feature in this case, because if you don't have an escape function, like a condition like n less than four, what that means is that it'll run like theoretically forever, right? Like if it doesn't actually converge. Um, so the query plan can be quite complex. Um, so it has a hard-coded recursion depth as a configuration property to 10. So you mm. see that the query plane just goes 10 recursions deep. Yeah. That's a default value to just sort of like make, put a bit of a safety bracket in case. Because if you do that with a bigger query with lots of data, of course you can like <laughs> put a pretty big load onto your system, For obviously. Sure. Um, but it's, it's a session property. So you can also tune it, right? Like to have it higher if you know and that kind of stuff. So cool. Um, definitely a cool feature in my opinion. Yeah. And and one of those examples where it's like, oh my gosh, right? Like SQL can do things I would not have thought. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like in general, recursion just sounds scary in a, in a SQL language. Just, you know, if it, when it comes to, when you come to thinking about how quickly things can escalate in, in any type of recursive function. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, and uh, just to be clear uh, for, for those that are listening, uh, it's, you know, you, we're just taking the, the function that we're running in this recursion is simply just taking the previous N and then adding one and then only going up to four. Uh, so I wanted to reiterate that if that wasn't clear and then the, the base value is one. So then you basically just get one, one plus one, one plus you know, two, which is the previous one and then one plus th th three. So you get one, two, three, four as the values. And then uh, you know, if you're pulling a sum, you would expect that you know, 
four, three, one, and two will ultimately add up to ten. So that's that's ultimately the query that's being ran here. It's nothing like crazy, but it's just I guess it's just the the method that we're using to get there is is pretty crazy. So yeah, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Like if you like um, the the webinar with Martin, uh, sorry, with David actually um, about the advanced SQL has a lot of those kind of things where it's oh, more yeah. like oh, like really eye opening things where it's like oh, SQL can do that. Yeah, I need to. So m one of my charters uh, in the next couple of weeks is going to be to take some of those snippets of those uh, the the nuggets that those guys left for us, and I'm going to try to put some blog posts around that too because I think like you know it's nice to have a two hour video if you have the time to just you know grab some popcorn and you. Know, you know, get a little, uh, a little bit of bourbon or something like that. You know, just <laughs> sit back and listen to Dane, David, yeah, and Martin. Yeah, just be careful. You might not understand those queries. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll help you. It just uh, you know, it's that uh, was a Balmer peak or something. <laughs> yeah, get into the flow, right? Yeah, fair enough. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, cool, cool PR. I like it. Uh, it's definitely one of those like simple ones to understand, uh, simple enough to understand uh, as long as you understand recursion, and uh, you know, definitely a lot of fun. So. Yeah. Um, Let's go on to the uh, question of the week. Um, so this one uh, was kind of self-nominated. Uh, we want to, let me, let me quickly pull up. I have uh, a, a Katakota example that I am gonna, that I've set up. Uh, I can actually add this into the, uh, to the notes. I, I'm currently not, not on a paid version of Katakota. So if enough people are on this, this might run ridiculously slow, <laughs> but, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, basically, I'm going to be writing a blog post around, around this as well. So we'll, we'll I'll, I'll uh, share this with the community uh, either next week or something like that. Uh, we get a question that comes up a lot. Uh, let me ask just a couple of the questions that have come up in previous weeks. So, um, so some of the questions are something like along the lines of, okay, is there a way to get data from the from S3 buckets without using the Hive connector? Um, another question we got, and this is all questions that we're getting from Presto SQL Slack. Uh, hello, I have a question on the relationship between Hive and S3 and Presto Hive. Uh, right now, I am trying to understand uh, I'm trying to write a Presto connector for Amazon's S3. And throughout some research, I found out that Presto provides the connector for S3, but I wasn't able to find it until I went into Presto Hive. So I'm curious why S3 has been placed inside Hive and direct relationship between Hive and Pres S3 and Presto. So just, I think the basic question that's being asked here is like, we w we did all this work. Like I'm, I'm working right now, you know, like let's say I'm currently at a, at a, shop and I, I hear about Presto as an alternative to maybe some existing like hive hell that I'm living in right now where all anytime I try to run a query, like it's going to take hours for me to get anything to return. And, you know, my the 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 mid level mid tier teams are complaining to me front end teams are complaining like nothing's coming back fast enough and so everything's you know raining down on me and then I hear about this Presto solution, uh, you know, and so I go in and I investigate it. I hear it's super fast. It's solving all of my all of my issues with uh, with running any of these queries on Hive. Um, so the question kind of comes in like, what uh, what does the Hive connector? You know, I, I kind of go in there and I see that there's this Hive connector, and that's how I am going to be able to access my current HDFS uh, file system and my S3. So does the Hive connector actually require me to install? the Hive runtime with all the messy Hive Hadoop dependencies. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of, uh, I'm going to go through this in a more, more clearly in a blog post, but in general, that's not going to be the case. And so I wanted to clear up why the Hive connector is called the Hive connector and kind of what, uh, what's, it's, what's actually happening underneath that so that you, you know, users that like are basically engineers that don't want to are trying to move away from hive and get away from the kind of slow uh, drudgy kind of etl type mentality uh and they need some faster kind of interactive analytics you know which is why people would go to presto like what's actually happening and so you can basically think about all of these systems as three like the the hive system in general when you start out with just hive as three kind of sections so you have a runtime uh, which is the Hive uh, services and executables that are actually, you know, mapping your queries into these like MapReduce uh, uh, jobs that are running on top of HDFS or S3 or whatever file storage. And then then oh, that takes me into the file storage. Then you have, you know, 
either HDFS or, you know, some S3 object store, or it could be, you know, Azure blob storage, any, any, or MinIO kind of any, any kind of uh, storage that, you know, holds onto these like objects or files. Um, that's going to be where you're, where you're pulling these, um, you know, you have, have this kind of uh, segment of, of your architecture. So runtime file storage. And then the last piece is like, Hive basically is storing all these all these things on onto these files, these kind of binary files or JSON files, and it needs to have a way to kind of understand a like where's the file located, how am I gonna actually understand like when I parse this file apart, where uh, you know what what fields am I expecting to see? Let's say it's JSON for instance. Uh, maybe some people aren't as familiar with like orc or something like that or uh but uh you have like json and you have like you know columns in there and so or basically uh uh what is it o object fields and so in those object fields you want to kind of map that into like a table right and so those 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 uh fields are going to map into a uh, a column on on your hive table and ultimately you need to figure out how do i go from you know this binary blob parse parse that blob you know find it in the first place know what format it's in so it's a json format and then how do i parse that into you know some some actual table that i'm going to be reading on hive so uh you know hive basically uses this separate service called the hive metastore um and that hive metastore is backed by some mysql database um and so uh you would have these three components the runtime that is, uh, you know, basically where you what you interact with to run these jobs. The meta store that holds all of the the metadata, basically, um, to understand the files, and then obviously the file storage itself. So what Presto is doing in this case is you're actually keeping, you know, you're not going to touch the file storage. That's where the files currently exist, and you're not going to touch the meta store because that also holds all of your current state. Right. You don't want uh, back in the Facebook times, you know, when when uh, when Presto was being created, you know, there was a 300 petabyte existing data warehouse that just is not going to be something that you can just move overnight and and change around. And so um, so this was the problem that that Facebook was solving at that time uh, and, and what ultimately, you know, developed to be Presto. But then at, uh, eventually, uh, you know, this was going to be some common pattern that, you know, was was why a lot of people uh, evolved to use Presto is because you can simply replace this you know Hive runtime and move in a Presto runtime instead. So if you look at like kind of a, a an example where you would see like Presto has its you know the coordinator and it you have your your fleet of of Presto workers and you're kind of interacting with Presto through either a JDBC or or directly through the CLI. You you send your your request to it. It's no longer going to do all of these, you know, heavy map reduce uh, uh, jobs or anything like that that are going to take all this extra time, and you're you're not having to, um, you know, run all of these. Uh, basically, basically having to do all of this like kind of slow, uh, uh, outdated type of ways to handle like ETL type jobs, right? You you're basically going to be running over Presto the same way that Martin kind of described, where you have this fleet of workers and they're going to through massive par massively parallel processing uh, uh, and and distributed pro uh, processing, you know, you're basically going to get this this work done ridiculously fast, all all done in a, this kind of pipeline manner where things are just like you know moving uh, at the speed of the the data being read off the uh, off the disk. Um, and so what still exists there though, in that case, you, the runtime is changed, but the meta store is still there and that's still called the hive meta store. And it's still using the hive data model to actually model the data that's sitting on the file storage. So, so this is why when we, when we have this hive connector, it's being called the hive, you could maybe a better name, <laughs> you know, this is always like where, you know, this naming thing naming is, is hard, right? <laughs> ridiculously hard. <laughs> so maybe a better name. And I'm just going to say, you know, this is a maybe because this is probably either too big or it's different or nobody's going to know what it means. But, you know, if you called it the Hive Metastore connector, you know, that would be maybe kind of describing it more, but could be confusing Yeah, in but other then ways. it talks about connecting to the Hive Metastore. Like it could also be called the object storage connector or whatever, yep. right? Like yeah. anyway, I think it's like, 
historic it, it does make sense to some degree and historically changing it would be just very uh, tricky yeah um, for sure I wanted to just like point out one aspect and that is the way the reason you can take away basically hive um, uh, and replace it with Presto to, to some large extent is that the connection to the Hive Metastore is basically a known entity, like it's basically kind of standardized. And more importantly, the connection to the file storage is essentially standardized because yep. there's literally just kind of two protocols. There's the Hadoop HDFS kind of access model. Mm -hmm. And then there is the S3 way of doing it. Amazon S3 came in early into this object storage for all the cloud storage systems. And it kind of really created a de facto standard. So yep. there's a lot of what they call S3 compatible object storage. And those include small lightweight ones like MinIO, mm -hmm. but also like, you know, well-known ones from other cloud operators, right? So yeah. that's why Presto can just basically look straight at the storage and understand what's going on because there's these established protocols. For sure. That's, that's, that's in, in good. Yep. Yeah, totally. And so... I mean, yeah, so I'm kind of, I said that a little bit tongue in cheek, like, <laughs> we're, you know, we, there's so many different names that you can put on there. And I actually, at one point, uh, you know, opened up a, uh, a request uh, that eventually got closed, but, you know, made a couple suggestions for, for alternate names. And ultimately, I mean, it just, it would add confusion in, in some ways and clarify things in other ways. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's issue 3776 on the Presto SQL Presto uh, uh, side. I'm not going to really make that a, a, a central thing, but it, it just, you know, after it's kind of explained and you get this kind of background, then it makes a lot of sense why it's called the Hive con Connector. But definitely, I think that's one of the, when you first get into Presto and you're maybe currently on a Hive, you know, on Hive and you're trying to get away from Hive, when you see that there's this Hive connector, you're like, why in the world would I ever want to use that? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. so it, it makes sense why people get confused around that. And and I was definitely confused when I first got into Presto around that. So any so in general, if you are ever connecting to Hadoop, if you're ever connecting to uh, any type of like S3 file storage, you're going to use the Hive uh, connector. And all it's going to be using is you, you just need to have Hive Metastore. There's no other Hive binaries that, that get thrown into the mix. And Hive Metastore is really just a very thin uh, service that, um, that basically just takes in uh, requests to update different fields or different columns and different table names, things like that. And uh, it it's basically has this Thrift API you know, that sits on top of it. And then uh, Presto knows how to interact with that and basically update all of the, uh, you know, lo file locations or anything, anything you need to know to basically find a file in your file storage, dice it up and figure out, you know, how to, uh, how to make meaning of, of, of all that. So of all, of all yeah, the if data. You, if you, if you come from a relational database background, you can think of the Hive Metastore kind of as the same as the information schema yeah. that's often available, cool. which basically tells you these are all the tables I have. These are all the, the columns slash like rows in it. Uh, and they have these data formats like, you know, var char n or var char 100 or yep. timestamp or whatever. Like, and it does that for the object storage. And it can use any like uh, MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres are the, sort of the common choices, I think. All right. So do you think we've pretty well answered this? Is there anything you had that you wanted to add to any of no, this? I think that's it. Um, the one aspect, obviously, is that, um, yes, um, the documentation on that is also constantly being upgraded so and updated. So we are hoping to break up the Hive Connector documentation because it is very complex and has all these different things and want to add more information that sort of like captures that better. But the, as I said, it's an open source project. There's a lot going on. So For we're sure. just trying to catch up with all the docs work as well. So it's all, all happening. All right, cool. Well, uh, if that is it, then uh, that's pretty much our show for today. Uh, just needed to go through a couple things. The uh, music for the show uh, is from the Mega Man 6 gameplay album by Christoph Slawikowski. <laughs> and uh, if you want to find Manfred or myself, uh, you can find us uh, on the Slack channel. Uh, that will be added into the show notes. But uh, just to, it's easy enough to say say out loud uh, if I have it up here. It is presto. PrestoSQL.io. 
slash slack slash slack there you go uh so you can find us uh on the presto dash community dash broadcast channel uh once you've signed up there uh or otherwise you can uh, just direct message uh, uh myself brian olson or manfred moser and uh, we'll be more than happy to take in any requests uh i uh, forgot to mention this before but uh the question uh, of the week and the PR of the week, we want that to be very community driven. So if you have any suggestions or any input as to what those should be, whether it's a, a PR that you've done yourself or one that you think is just super cool and you've learned how to use some of the functionality there, uh, we can you know definitely look into uh, uh, covering that. Um, if you are somebody who has uh, actually authored any of those and you would like to kind of join the show, we could even look into uh, in, you know interviewing you and kind of getting some little more details, fine-grained details on uh, on some of the PRs. And so anything, anything definitely we would uh, be interested in uh, hearing about. So uh, you'll reach out to us on the same channels uh, to do that. Um, otherwise, uh, let me see. The uh, last thing I would want to say is that, uh, oh, yeah, where were we going to, where, where can they find you on Twitter, Manfred? Oh, I'm at Simplicility on Twitter. You can also just Google my name. You probably end up finding me and on Slack and wherever else. Great. And I am uh, Bits on Data Dev, uh, B I T S on Data Dev, uh, uh, and that's going to be on uh, Twitter. And uh, remember, for fast data at Resto, Presto is the besto. Thank you, and we'll see you next show. Two weeks' time. Two weeks. <laughs> see you guys. All righty. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>